Paul, welcome back to the show. Thanks, it's been another week. How's yours? Pretty awesome. Hey, would you like to hear a really stupid story about Fire Cider? I, I hope that's a video game. Fire Cider is a drink. So, so what it is, is it's apple cider with like spices in it. Um, I think like, I don't actually know what spices, but it is definitely hot, right? It is like Tabasco kind of hot. Okay. Um, my wife drinks it. She has like a shot of it every morning for health reasons. She says I should drink it, but um, I tried it once and no. I don't know what it's supposed to save me from, but I'll just die, thanks. <laughs> you had to do a corpse run after taking a shot. <laughs> right. But anyway, she's running out, so she ordered another bottle. You, it's hard to find it sometimes, so she just orders it from Amazon. But it took a while to get here. And when it arrived, it was not in an Amazon box. Hmm. And it was not packaged according to Amazon's rules. And, hmm. well, let me tell you how it was packaged. Picture, okay, Fire Cider comes in a very small, like, a small bottle. This is not, this isn't something you sit around and drink all day, right? You, you have a shot of it. This is like a two liter something. or something. Right. Right. It, it's a pretty small bottle. You have like a shot of it. And I think some people use it to mix other drinks. Mm, sure. And so normally the box isn't that big. It's like the size of a shoe box, if that. But this box was like mini fridge size, right? <laughs> so this is pretty big. Uh -huh. um, filled and it's just a plain box, no Amazon marking. Taped shut. With normal, to, not the, you know, it was obviously not packaged by Amazon. You right, open right. it up and there's just sort of, pay, like, this small bottle is sort of floating around inside this giant box and there's just, like, a big wad of, of brown paper to keep it, you know, from bouncing <laughs> around all the time. Right. But the bottle is inside of a plastic bag and the uh -oh. and the and the bottle has okay the plastic bag is filled with fire cider and a bottle <laughs> right <laughs> right okay i'm i'm beginning to reconstruct what happened now <laughs> right so it's just this big sack and it's not even tied well i mean this is liquid dear whoever packaged this it's liquid that is obviously broken free of its container. So they dumped it into a plastic bag. And I mean, the, the, the bottle is just swimming around in there. It is basically a plastic bag of liquid. And then they just tied a very loose knot in the end of the plastic bag. Like, this isn't like a <laughs> Ziploc bag. This is just a big plastic sack with, like, a loose knot. So, of course, and, oh, the, the most important thing is that the smell is horrendous. It is offensive because it has not been kept properly. It has gone off. And just opening up the cardboard, leaving the plastic closed, you could smell it. The moment you pop open the box, you're like, oh, it is retch-inducing. Awful, offensive smell. Like, so, sometime during transit, evidently some doofus ruptured the container, it started leaking, and this was their solution. Don't tell anyone. Just make the problem go away. No one will notice. <laughs> it will be fine. So Heather calls up the, the or, you know, Amazon or whatever, messages, I'm sure. Um, this place, you know, this was an Amazon third-party seller, and it's like, hey, you're package arrived in this weird condition and the next day they replied with no problem just return it <laughs> and she's like return it this thing should this thing will definitely not survive another trip in the mail and should not i mean it would probably be illegal to transport this in the mail <laughs> right it's a biohazard Right, this offensive, foul-smelling, and if you get any, I mean, aside from the wretch-inducing smell, um, 
you know, this, it's like a, a big liquid bag of something that is incredibly hot. So if you've got it on your hands, uh, that would be bad. Like, this can harm you. <laughs> right, right. Eyes, nose, and soft tissues, beware. Right. And it's spoiled. So, I mean, just, but they were like, just return it. And so she had to like, no, no, you don't want this back. And they're like, no, here's the process. And, you know, ship it here and take it here and they'll send it back. And she's like, it's in a bag. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell you what, you can send your hazmat team. They can do whatever they want, but I'm not going to give this to the package deliverer. That was hilarious. I just loved that. No problem. Just return. Like, if she'd done that, what would somebody in receiving do when they popped open that box? They would not be glad to get that back. Trust me, you don't want uh, it. Yeah, I, I don't know if the carrier would take it. I, I'm i surprised that they delivered it at all. Right? Which makes me think they must have been the ones to, you know, cause the problem yeah. in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> just pretend nothing happens. As far as anyone knows, it was fine the last time we saw it. In the non-Amazon box, in a plastic bag. <laughs> in a plastic bag. So how was your week? What have you done with yourself this week, Paul? Well, I've been playing Valheim pretty much nonstop. I actually check my hours because Steam keeps track of your hours. And I, uh, in the first week that I owned Valheim, I played it an average of 11 hours a day. So I figured, hey, I'm going to make something of this. And so I recorded some game footage. I was going to like make some videos because, you know, what do you do when you play games all the time? Make some videos and put them on YouTube. Right. Uh, so I recorded some footage and I was going to do a few tutorials and stuff. And uh, I was like, man, it's been a while since I did some video editing, you know, other than the die cast. And I'd started using DaVinci Resolve, but this is going to be like the first video <laughs> that I edited that wasn't the die cast. I can on, just in see DaVinci this Resolve. now. All right. Hey, YouTube. I'm here with a, another video on here's how to waste 11 hours of your life. That's going to be about half your day. The first thing you're going to want to do is boot up Valheim. <laughs> <laughs> I should have done that, actually, but, uh, but no. There's still time, I suppose. <laughs> if you say so. It sounds like you're running out. Yeah. Well, so, so I, I was like, I'm going to put this in DaVinci Resolve. So I got the footage and put it in DaVinci Resolve and started editing it, you know, and cropping stuff out. And one of my kids walks up and he's like, hey, why is, the, why is the video all green on the edge? And I looked closely at the footage and sure enough, like it's, it's not properly formatted. It's like kind of shoved up in a corner and then there's a bunch of weird noise along the bottom. It's all like green and black. And then like the image is repeated horizontally like it, it it's got some sort of weird encoding Tiles. thing going on yeah oh, yeah and uh so i was like that's very odd and so i look at the i look at the footage and davinci resolve thinks that it's in 2k but i know the video is in 1080p because windows when i, I just use like the windows xbox game recorder thing and it always just down samples sure. it to 1080p but my monitor is in 2K. So for some reason, like some piece of metadata in the video was telling DaVinci Resolve that it's 2K when it's not. And, uh, and so it's causing all these weird encoding problems. So I was like, okay, well, that's fine. Like, I'll just fix it. Like, I'll just tell DaVinci Resolve that it's a different size, right? Like, you can do that. It's a professional video editing software. Right. Of course. So I looked around and I couldn't find the setting. And so I went online and I was like, how do you change the size of the thing? And it's like, oh, here's how you change the, the footage dimensions of your, your whole project or whatever. And I was like, well, yeah, like I can do that. But, and so I did, I, I, it, was in, it was already in 1080p. Like the project was in 1080p. It just thought that that strip was in 2K. Like, how do I change just that one strip? And uh, so I looked around some more and all of the results I was getting were like, you know, how to change the the resolution of your project. Because, like, DaVinci Resolve apparently just handles all this stuff on its own. So I finally searched for something like, what was it? 2K footage DaVinci Resolve 
wrong resolution 1080 or something in some sort of like this specific problem and hey i found right. a, a thread a forum thread and they're like change this weird setting in your system registry and so i went in there and it didn't have that setting and then so I, I read further down in the thread and they're like oh well actually change this other thing in your system directory so i, I looked in there mm. didn't have that setting either so i read further down in the thread and there was a guy who was like hey Three years later, I hope it's not too late. I have the same problem. I tried finding these directories and I couldn't find them. And then the last reply is, oh yeah, DaVinci Resolve doesn't let you actually change this uh, at, at all. So you're just going to have to like change the way you record the video. Sorry. <laughs> <It's> like, really? <laughs> like there's no way to change the resolution, like the metadata recording. And it was like, it, and then someone else was like, oh, well, you know, why don't you just, why don't you just fix the problem, right? And it's like, there isn't a problem. There's no problem with the footage. I can play it in Windows Media Player. I can play it in VLC. I can play it in Blender. They all work fine. None of them thinks it's in 2K. It's just this stupid DaVinci Resolve that thinks it's too smart to, for anyone to tell it what's going on. Oh, that's terrible. That is frustrating. So I've got like an hour of footage and like I'm going to have to re-record all this? Like, I, what am I going to do? And then I got to thinking, hang on. Blender can play it. Blender can, can edit this video. <laughs> so, so I took the footage and I put it in Blender and I told Blender, make me a 1080p video out of this. And Blender's like, it's already 1080p, but whatever. Here we go. <laughs> so I re-encoded the whole thing. I'm sure there was like losses and it got downsampled or, you know, like it's even worse quality now than it was before. And the window, you know, the windows Xbox thing doesn't do a good job of recording video, but whatever. And then I took that footage and it was actually fairly easy once I had that footage to just tell DaVinci Resolve, instead of using this one that you're using right now, use this other one. And all the edits worked and everything and it like dropped and replaced it all. So I was able to edit it while it was re-rendering the other footage. Nice. And uh, so that was nice, but I just thought it was fantastic that DaVinci Resolve needed to be rescued by Blender. That is, and it's cool that Blender just enabled you to fix that. I'm sure I could have done it in VLC or, or whatever, but that was the tool that I was familiar with. So yeah, yeah, it is pretty cool. I like it. All right. Um, so I didn't know this was out. This has apparently been out for a while. Oh no, I'm I'm wrong. It it came out on the 19th. So this is a recent release. But I had not heard anything about this. Portal Reloaded. It's it's a sort of a an an extension to Portal 2 made by the community. And the hook hmm. this time is that you've got, you know, your blue portal and your orange portal and a time portal. Hmm. So the time portal, the, the gimmick is uh, there are two versions of the testing facility. There's the future one, 20 years in the future and everything's all run down and, you know, the, the, drop, the drop ceiling is collapsed and the, there's dust on everything, right? It's just crappy. And then there's present yeah, day yeah. where everything's tidy and, and clean. So you can always tell where you are if you're in the present or the future sure and then you get this square portal that lets you travel between the two so you have three portals now and there's interesting problems with that you can like a, there's a lot of just like in portal there's a lot of box and button problems i mean that's most of the puzzles is sure put a sure. box on the button open the door go through the door you can um you can you can't take the box from the present into the future it fizzles it just evaporates but you mm, can okay. take the box from the future and bring it back to the present but if you alter <laughs> okay but if you alter the fate of the box well for one thing if you yeah if you alter the fate of the present box it will change the future box as well right so let's say let's say i just pick up the box in the present and put it on a button i can go to the future and yep 
there it is, still sitting on the button where I put it 20 years ago. <laughs> okay, yeah. But if I pick up the button now in the future, the, 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 or the box, the box is all dusty now, so you can always tell the future box from the present box, and this is important. Let's say I move the future box and just put it in the corner. It'll stay there, fine. But then I go back to the present and move the box again the one in the future will now snap. Any change you make to the present box immediately moves the future box to that spot in the future um, mm. because you've changed its history. Which means you now have mm. a way, you now have a way to remove a box remotely. Like, put a Put the future box on a button. Mm, right. Do right. do whatever you want to do, and then just nudge the present box, and the future box will go away. And uh, so that's an interesting mechanic. And there's a lot of puzzles that revolve around that. Or fling yourself, you know, through portals like you normally do. But in the middle of that, also fling yourself through the time portal and go through this thing in the future and not in the present. So I'm going to start the puzzle in the present and then fling myself in the future where it won't have this wall in my way when I come rocketing out of the time portal. Uh, it, wow. Yeah, so these puzzles are not joking around. They are not. Portal 2 suffered from a bit of, oh, I got this. You know, you, you kind of solve, especially in the first half of the game, you solve a lot of the puzzles mm. very quickly. But the, the time puzzles were really slowing me down. I mean, in a good way. And the other thing I thought, oh, it's fan-made. Oh, no. Oh, no. I can't, I can't bear the thought of cringy internet kids thinking they can write Ugh. in the style of Portal. Right, right. Oh, that's going to be so bad. And it actually isn't. Um, they don't have GLaDOS show up, or at least not yet. I've done, you know, a dozen puzzles or whatever. And Okay. So they don't have the, discount GLaDOS and discount right. Cave Johnson. Right. There's no bad OS or whatever. <laughs> they have the... Um, I don't know. The voice doesn't have a name. But before GLaDOS wakes up, there's another sort of announcer voice that shows up. Welcome to the Enrichment Center. That pre-recorded voice. Mm -hmm. They, I guess that's a... They either hired that voice actor or they used that particular style of voice synthesis. Um, it sounds like it's read by a voice actor because it stresses syllables and it leans into things to make jokes work. But I don't know. Um... But the, the writing fits. It's not as smart as Eric Wolpaw's Portal 2, okay? That, they, they don't reach that high bar. But it's also not cringe. It even got a few chuckles out of me, and that's hard. Like, that's really, really hard. And they did a pretty good job of it. Like, um, the, the first puzzle is, it just sort of locks you in this room and the door in front of you is closed. <clears throat> And it's about to introduce you to the time portal. And it's like, this door will open in four hours and 20 years. Okay, and by reversing the two, you're like, <laughs> you know, you're, you're expecting <laughs> right. four hours right. and three minutes. And, <laughs> right. And, so, and that feels like the original game. That, that works. And so I really want to yeah. commend this, this team. Good job. Eric Wolpaw is an incredible writer and you manage to capture his voice and that's really really hard to do i know it is and so wow hats off and the, the game's pretty good too it's very it's a very good looking game again that's maybe cool it's not, that's very yeah. cool didn't it, overreach they had a, a good goal right. they had some good objectives and, uh, and they kept the scope in and, and nailed it. That sounds great. I'll have to look it up. So is it free or is it five bucks or totally something? Free. Totally wow. free. Totally free. Which feels like a rip. I mean, I'm ripping them off, not the other way around. Um, so yeah, highly recommended. Portal Reloaded. I don't normally reckon, recommend, you know, 
fan made stuff like this, but it if you liked Portal 2, I this is that not quite as good. But that's not like should not be taken as an insult. Not quite as good. Oh man. <laughs> this movie's not as good as Citizen Kane, <laughs> you know? <laughs> not quite. Good job to that team. All right. Yeah, they really need a name for their team other than the Portal 2 Reloaded guys. Do they have it? Um, yeah, Portanus is the name of the developer and publisher. Which makes me think of Artanus, the character from StarCraft 2, but like his portly brother. Like this... <laughs> like this fat <laughs> Protoss. Portanus. <laughs> Portanus. <laughs> Or maybe Artanis after he gets killed. Oh, poor Tanis. Aren't the aren't the Protoss all like unusually thin? Yes. So what would a fat one even look like? I have no idea. I mean, if you could load the model, just you know, extrude it along those surface normals and see what you end up with. That's right. Put it in Blender, Alt S, just crank that sucker up. What do you say we do some mailbags? We've got quite a few this week. Yeah, let's jump on it. Show's almost half over. Oh, you're kidding. Time flies. All right, uh, I'll let you take this first one while I take some tea. Dear Diecast, reminiscing about gaming when I was growing up in the 90s, there are obvious things one could be nostalgic for, like big boxes, hefty manuals, and generous feelies. But then I suddenly remembered that on the tail end of the DOS PC games, there were really elaborate installers, especially the one of the Command & Conquer it came to mind as seen here in this YouTube link. But there were others too. I know that Command & Conquer Remastered did try to bring it back in in a way, but for the most part, installation has become an invisible process. We just hit download and after a while we can play the game. Which, while I'm sure it's much more convenient than installing installers and hogging the computer, there's no more need to juggle disks or even diskettes. I still feel like I'm kind of missing getting drawn into the experience via a well-designed installation interface. What's your take on that? And are there others nowadays? Uh, there are other nowadays obscure gaming-related relics that you are nostalgic for. Kind regards, Norbert Coliseratus Leakle. Leakle. Le is that Leakle? Le Leakle. Thank you, Norbert, for your question. I watched the video, and that is just charming. I I'd never played Command and Conquer, and so I'd never install it. But um, that installation thing is just like. So fun. It's it's a fun little it's like a, a little video basically. Um and I kind of wonder if the the speed at which we can get data over the internet has neg negated the need for that kind of that kind of uh entertainment, I guess. Like back in the right. day, if you were installing Command and Conquer, you wouldn't have access to, you know, like, oh, I'm installing my game, I'm gonna watch a YouTube video or something while it's installing. Um, that's all you could do. Like, what else are you going to do with your computer? And so they You're have the privilege alt -tab of... to another DOS window? <laughs> Good luck <laughs> right. with that. Yeah. Yeah, run it on another thread on your supercomputer. I'm going to... I'm going to go alt-tab to another another terminal window and list files that exist on my C drive. Because that's exciting. <laughs> right. But I remember, like, um, they, they still do... Okay, so the, here's the, the closest approximation that I can get to the kind of thing that they're doing with this installer, is um, the loading game interface for SimCity 2000. And, and all, most of the Sim games had this, but I remember SimCity 2000 specifically, uh, just because I played it a lot. And it had that little thing where it, it'd have the... It'd always have reticulating splines on there, right? And, like, yeah. there's all those little things that would come up, and you could read them if your computer was slow enough. <laughs> right? And then you could do... Then sometime, you know, six years later, you're like, it just all flashes by, and you're like, I, there's no way to read any of that. It's just lost. Right. And I kind of wonder if the Command & Conquer installer, like, at some, at some point would have been mostly just taking up your time instead of actually installing the game. Right. There's an interesting, like, yeah, we, we don't need something to keep us entertained while we wait for stuff to 
get copied to our hard drive off of a floppy disk, which is by necessity a time-consuming process. Like, if floppy drive speeds did not go up that much. If they were still making them today, it, it would not be great. <laughs> it would still be mm -hmm. kind of slow to get that one megabyte off the dang thing. It's like, um, oh, back, back in the day, I used to load programs off a of cassette tape for my computer. And, you know, cassette player only goes so fast. And there are physical reasons why it, you know, can't go faster. The, you know, you spit, you move that tape too fast and you're going to stretch it. And then that will kill your data. Mm. So, yeah, you, that was a fixed need. No matter how fast your computer got, there's still that time to copy stuff off the drive. And uh, so I really appreciated those installers, too. The, the sort of the last hurrah of this kind of gimmick that I can think of was in Mass Effect where the character creator was integrated with the universe. So, like, it's like, oh, welcome to the Alliance Network, as if you're looking up employee files on a network, right? And, oh, mm -hmm. wait, record's not found. We have to rebuild it. And so you rebuild, quote unquote, your your file for Commander Shepard. Like what is it what does he or she look like and what's their first name and origin story and everything. And it took longer than the modern approach of just new game and just dump you know, just walk you through the the character creator. But it had a certain charm to it. It, it it felt like you were already playing the game, put it that way. Hmm. It's not an installer, but uh, Dwarf Fortress world generation comes to mind, where it's spending time generating the history and the, the movements of armies and civilizations and the, all that stuff, and you can kind of watch it unspooling as it's, as it's going. And uh, I guess it's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, although it's not gratuitous like the command and conquer installer is just completely gratuitous right it doesn't have anything directly to do with the game whereas right. uh, procedural generation I, I think it would be cool if like minecraft for example had some uh some kind of way to visualize what it's generating instead of just like the green rectangle they've got now the green rectangle you mean a progress bar well no when you start up minecraft and you make a new world it, it does that thing where it like now you can see how much of the, the how many of the chunks have been generated. It kind of like spirals out. Oh right, I forgot about that. It's new, yeah. But that's basically like just a weird progress bar. <laughs> right, right. It would, would be it would be, be cool, cool if, if you'd you like, could see something of it. Yeah, like see wireframes just sort of radiating out from you as it generates stuff, and then the game could just fade in. Mm -hmm. And it could go reticulating splines. <laughs> it could, it could, but it doesn't. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I like the idea of, of making the installer part of the experience, um, but I also like the idea of the installer being so fast that you don't even notice it's happening. Yeah, there's a lot to be said for both for both things. Um, the more in love. I am with the game, the more patience I have for tomfoolery. <laughs> I, if I'm already really digging a game, I'm, you know, I'll be there and I'll watch it install. I am eager for this. If it's like, oh, another one of these from that one company, I install it in the background. I'll play it, you know, in a couple of hours when I get bored with whatever I'm doing now. And so if those have, like today, you often alt-tab while the installer's running. And so if they try and do anything fancy, it's either, you know, you're not going to know it's happening, or much worse, you're going to hear all this crap in the background while you're just, you know, <laughs> surfing the internet. You'll be hearing, you know, the, the, I hate, like, installers that play music. Recently, recently I installed, uh, well, it was last year, the new Flight Simulator game. 
and it played music while it was downloading this gargantuan, I forget how many gigabytes it was, but this was a huge oh, file. No. And, you know, this is going to take hours. And you're just going to play that <laughs> not long, you know, one minute musical loop for hours? Are you kidding? And it doesn't silence itself when you alt tab away. They expect you to just sit there and watch this ultra slow progress bar and listen to one minute of music. It was a very weird decision. Wow. You could mute the music though. Uh, okay, good. Yeah, I do kind of miss that stuff. I, and yeah, there is no demand for it. It wouldn't, the game wouldn't benefit from it. Most of us wouldn't notice. It doesn't take long enough. Um, and if they were going to spend any extra time on on development, like triple A play triple A publishers are like, no, don't spend time on things that the players are only see once. Um, if they were going to spend any time, rather than making the waiting periods more interesting, I I wish they'd, you know, get their programmers cracking on making the waiting periods go away. Like it, it happens sometimes. Yeah. You just somebody puts in the time and just makes a game without loading screens, or you know, well hidden ones, right? So that right. Well, you know, a lot of the open world games now are like that, where right, you know, satisfactory and Valheim and you know, all these big worlds that are Minecraft. Right, you get some startup time. The, the, there's time to launch the program. There's time to load in the save, but then once you're there. There's never any more loading screens. Everything just streams in, in the background. Mm hmm It'd be kind of cool if they could make the installer like that, I think. I think that would be awesome. Like, have it just install the stuff that you need for, like, right when you're starting the game. Like, the menu. And while you're in the menu, it's streaming in the rest of the game. Yeah. Some games do that. I think, uh... I think Blizzard has a well, few Well, the Flight Simulator do game that. does that, right? Like, in a, in a way. I don't remember. Didn't they have like oh, it, terabytes of data for Microsoft, oh, the new oh, Microsoft Flight oh, Simulator? Like yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that definitely. Like it has to stream in because you could never download the whole thing. Like you couldn't buy a hard yeah, drive yeah. big enough to but hold the data. It seems so weird that like they make you stream in data and download gigabytes of data. Right. I think the gigabytes is like the that you download is the bare minimum because you can turn off the streaming content. Like, oh, uh -huh. I'm, you know, roaming. Yeah, you can turn that off, and then the whole world will be just... It'll look like the flight sims from a generation ago. Nothing really mm -hmm. fancy. Flying over a city means, you know, flying over this flat piece of ground with four landmark buildings sticking out of it. <laughs> like, sure, as sure. if everything else was bulldozed. Right. Yeah, it'd be cool if you could do, if you could do the flight simulator thing where they're streaming in the data only... Only that's the installer too, right? Like the game itself is the installer. And like the things that you select in the main menu, like I want to do this thing, then that's your, then you're installing that thing on the fly. So you don't have to wait for anything, right? I mean, you right. might have to wait a little bit, but you don't have to wait for stuff that you're not going to use. Um, I do know that uh, I'm pretty sure it's Blizzard Games did that. Like... The game is downloading and it's like, hey, there's enough, we got enough of the game now that you can play it now, you know, and you'll only have access to the first few missions, but by the time you play through them, the rest of it will be downloaded. Mm. Yeah, I seem to remember they did that. Yeah, I think it was in World of Warcraft too, like, okay, there's enough for you to enter the game and I don't know, maybe if like... You try to enter the Outlands, it'll be like, no, that that's not downloaded yet, but if you want to like spawn in the bear in the barrens or whatever you know yeah it gets all the starting cities or whatever first right and you you will definitely have the whole thing downloaded before you get to outlands if you're starting a new character <laughs> unless you're right. on dial up yeah i wonder if it like do you have to well it get it downloads enough for you to log in and then once you've logged in it knows where all your characters are so it can just download that stuff Oh, that's true. Speaking of dial-up, we're still getting pictures. Back in 2015, you know, the New Horizons spacecraft did that flyby of Pluto. Yes. I, I, 
I, I remember when it happened because I was writing about the planet called Horizon in Mass Effect while the flyby was being done by New Horizons in the real world. Oh, so while was, wow. So while I was writing one, I was like, that whole evening I was alt-tabbing for the next, you know, bit of news of what we'd seen of the planet or whatever. We were still getting the super high-res images from that mission that is now six years past. Because, you know, to download over that distance, it's basically dial-up speeds. Oh, like, man. All that stuff has been captured, but it's just gigabytes, and it just trickles in so slow because the probe is so far out there. It's it's all there. If it could just launch a thumb drive back to us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. That's incredible. I didn't realize that it was still streaming data back. Yeah, yeah. I just saw a new batch of, of pictures. These were of... Um, now, I would pronounce this, it's it's another planetoid, or it's a moon of, um, yeah, of Pluto, whatever Charon. it is. It, it, it looks like Charon to me, but I've seen people call it Sharon, like they soft sh sound at the beginning, and I'm like, is that right? Or Charon? Charon? Something. Maybe Charon? I don't know. It's really weird. I was very sure of how to pronounce it until I heard other people pronouncing it. Now I have no idea. Uh, that's the problem with listening to other people. Right? They all pronounce things wrong. <laughs> so, I, that was not a scheduled topic, but that was something that made me very happy. Is new pictures of Pluto. Anyway, they, they the new pictures coming in was of... Sharon or Charon or whatever it is and the the previously that was a blur and now we have the high-res images and it's really cool Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I know that the best the best images we got were Yeah, it was just you could barely Differentiate the two and uh, and now we've got now we've got some real pictures um also funny thing uh, Pluto and and Sharon or Car on. I hate not knowing what how you're not how you're supposed to pronounce it because no matter what you do now, somebody's gonna have a problem. Oh, I can't believe you don't know how to pronounce this. Anyway, these two things orbit each other and they are tidally locked to each other. And you know, um, uh, Pluto has that heart shape on the surface, and that heart is always facing away from the other planet. I thought that was a really fun thing. Like if you were standing on chair and, and you looked up, you'd never ever see the heart because <laughs> it's always facing away. It's always hiding its mm. heart. Yeah, just like just like our moon, you never see the far side right. of it. We never see any of the cool cities because they're all on the dark side of the moon. The moon people there. That's right. <sighs> Sucks. All right, let's do another one. I think the issue of broken in-game economy economies is fascinating. I've read Seamus's columns on the matter where he succinctly lays out the way the economy breaks due to a series of perfectly reasonable player desires. Seamus gave EVE Online and Borderlands 3 as two examples where in-game economies avoided complete collapse. I'm, I'm sorry everybody, I'm illiterate tonight. I don't, I'll, tr I'll work on that this week. Eve, due to real-world fidelity in Borderlands by offering a unique type of money sink. Do you think that a single-player RPG can both successfully avoid a broken economy and remain enjoy enjoyable? I tend to consider Mountain Blade, especially when modded, to be a good example of a game that avoids breaking the economy. I think this is in part because it blurs the line between RPG and strategy. I hope you're doing well and I always enjoy the diecast. Mark. So, uh, for me, the Borderlands games are basically single player. Like, I play them alone. Once in a while, my son and I have played together. Uh, but yeah, so I, you know, that's a single player RPG. You just need a good sink in the game. A way that the player can dump large amounts of their wealth into something that won't, that won't break the game, but will be attractive to mm. them. Uh, and gambling is the they've been doing this since Diablo 2 at least you could go up to the the shady merchant 
and buy unidentified items. And once you buy it, then you see what it is. So now, you know, your pockets are overflowing with billions of gold. You just walk over the mer the mer merchant and you just buy whatever. Oh, I need a new ring. You just buy all his rings. Oh, these suck. Sell them for much less than you bought them for. And, you know, repeat the process until you get a new, until you roll something good. And if it, you know, costs you half your money, who cares? Because you've got more, you know, that's the point of this exercise is to give you, it serves double purpose. For one, it can help you out if you've just gotten bad luck and you're missing a key piece of equipment. Like, wow, I haven't mm, gotten a new right. sword in 10 levels. Just, you know, the dice haven't been kind to me. My sword is kind of out of date and I'm underpowered. And it burns up a bunch of... So it's a safety net for bad luck and it's a money sink. That's a really good system. So yeah, that, but I, both of those games, I've always played them as a single player game. And it, I don't think it would work that well in a game trying to be taken seriously. Like it would be weird in a photorealistic world to have this inexplicable pay a billion dollars for a chance for a better you know, hat or whatever. <laughs> but in a, yeah. in a very systems-driven game, that's fine. Like, I don't think that sort of thing would work in The Last of Us. <laughs> in, this, in this horrible future apocalypse world where you happen to get billions of dollars somehow, but then there's a guy on the edge of the camp that will somehow accept your billions of dollars for a random item. That's... You know, that would make no sense in The Last of Us or whatever. Right. But that's also not an RPG either, right? Right, right. The RPGs are a little bit weird because they're kind of this tabletop RPG thing, which is based in uh, a lot of, well, like you've explained before, a lot of um, power fantasy kind of stuff. And so they're really fundamentally unhinged from reality in that way. So if you try to kind of bend them back to be like, does this really make sense? You're always going to find some flaw somewhere. Right. You, you can't just simulate everything. you got to draw the line somewhere. And so somewhere it's got to break. Well, and, and also like the, the whole conceit of an RPG is that your power is unreasonably high. Like it's, it's not a, the kind of game where you're playing even Dark Souls, right? Dark Souls is a, a fairly low power climb where... You right. can beat a lot of the a lot of the bosses with your starter gear if you're just that good. So you don't need to have this super high power. But even in Dark Souls, there is a, uh, a, a unreasonable amount of accumulation of of personal capability. Um, whereas in, in, I've talked with my friends about this when we we're playing D and D and stuff and uh, and GURPS, where the characters that you're playing are really more like, if you're going to make a real world analogy, they would be more like the kind of organization, like a, like a paramilitary organization or something. Like it's a whole group of people that would be able to accomplish the kind of things that your single character is accomplishing all on their own. And Right, right. And that just, there's no way for you to, like you could have a billion dollar corporation, right? And like that can accomplish all these crazy things. And that's fine because it's employing thousands and thousands of people. And so it's not like there's this one guy who's got all this money, who's just like, oh, well, now what am I gonna do with all this money, right? Like, I don't need that many Ferraris. Um, setting aside the fact that there are actually people in real life that have billions of dollars. Right, but they didn't it, earn it single-handedly just walking <laughs> around. <laughs> right, like you right. Usually, you yeah. usually need a company. Elon yeah, Musk and, just like and they're not in a world that vehicles. Yeah, and they're not in a world that has only them spending money in it. Right, right. That's the other thing about RPG economies: the blacksmith selling this golden flaming sword for one hundred thousand gold pieces, and he's in this farming village with twelve people. And it's like, why'd you yeah. make the sword, dude? Who do you think was going to buy it? I didn't get here until just now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, RPGs are, are weird. They are. It's funny to poke at their edges. 
I mean, that's just, you know, that's a lot of my humor, you know, when I do my let's play is, haha, let's apply logic to this thing that was never designed to withstand logic. If anyone can do it, though, I think, again, Dwarf Fortress is a great example of how you can have a deeply simulated world where it is possible to become incredibly powerful personally, but still have challenges and uh, and decisions, economic decisions that make sense. Just because it's, it's again, like you're not the only person doing things in the world and uh, your personal power is still insignificant compared to the sum total of all the activities that are going on. Right. Yeah, the games that are notoriously broken are like Bethesda games where you are basically a god who can, you know, fight a dozen people at once and survive and loot their bodies and all their and carry all their gear and all their gear is worth money and they respawn. And it's like, well, you know, that that has to break. There's no <laughs> there's no way to stop that from breaking. It, Seriously, uh, Bethesda games really need a money sink. Uh, housing was pretty good in uh, Skyrim. That was a pretty good money sink. Just, okay, I'll buy Oh, yeah, buy they did that in upgrade. Fable, too. Yeah, but that's in Fable. In order to benefit <laughs> from that, you'd have to play Fable. <laughs> uh, for all the story problems, my brothers and I had a, just a whale of a time playing Fable when we were kids. Hmm. Dear Diecast... In the past, Blender has come, yeah, in the very recently past, Blender has come up. We talked about it on the show. <laughs> in the past, Blender has come up as a program you quite like, and Seamus has spoken loftily about Visual Studio. Less so these days. So I was wondering, are there any other non-gaming programs you consider must-haves? Vail Tim. So yeah, for me, like, my computer isn't usable to do my stuff. Okay. Uh, like Notepad++, I don't use the Notepad that comes with Windows because it's horrible and awful. I use Notepad++. Um, Unity, Visual Studio, FileZilla for, for FTPing stuff, and a super old 2003 version of PaintShop Pro for my image editing because it starts up instantly. You know, usually when I'm image editing, I need to put a few words on it, crop the image, resize it, upload to my website. That's my workflow. And all the newer things are just so many features. You know, it wants to be, they all want to be Adobe Photoshop and it takes forever uh -huh. to launch and it takes uh -huh. forever to load an image and it's too much. There's like a billion features I'll never use. So I'm, I'm sticking to Paint Shop Pro 2003. And I'm just going to cry when we finally reach a version of Windows that won't run it anymore. And the last thing is FUBAR 2000 for uh, playing MP3s. Like, I have to install all that before I feel like my computer is ready for use. That is really interesting because on our lists, there is literally zero overlap. Uh, I should have I didn't think of VLC. I take VLC for granted so much. Yes, VLC should have been one of the first. For, I see VLC in your list. That should be at the top of mine because the default player in Windows is awful. It has always been awful. It is just always so horrible, slow to start up, weird. Every version has like, you know, they, they keep rewriting it from scratch or it looks wildly different from one version of Windows to another, uh -huh. but they're all terrible. Yeah. Yeah, you and VLC is completely similar. It's seamless. You click on a video and it plays the freaking video. It doesn't offer you it doesn't you don't click on it and then it opens up a splash page that's trying to sell you media. And then <laughs> yeah, in a smaller window start with oh, welcome to Microsoft Store. You can join the thing and here you can get latest rom-com movie for some reason. Buy it now for your Microsoft account and own it until we shut down the service uh, when we get bored with it. VLC so is a I also rectangle. Have, I also have VLC on the list. Um, and it's so the way I approach this is a little bit different. When when I install Windows on my computer because I've tried Linux and it doesn't work for me. Um, 
please send tweet. They, they've got all these pack-in programs like the media player, right? And my approach is I'm going to let Windows use all its defaults until it annoys me. And the moment it annoys right. me, I'm going to find another program that does the thing I want it to do. So I use Notepad. I just use Windows Notepad because it's never annoyed me. It's it's always done the things I wanted. I've never tried to do something that it's it's weirded out about. Um, it's really nice to be able to hit Windows key, N-O-T, enter, and like comes up and I can copy and paste to not paste formatting or whatever. Um, right. So like... I've tried using Notepad++ and it's kind of like the problem you have with the modern paint editing stuff. I, I just feel like it's trying to do too much and there are too many options. I just want it to like come up and have some place to paste text. So anyway, I, I just sure. use Notepad. Um, instead of uh, Unity, I, I have Steam. I, I almost always install Steam on computers, even my work computer, just because it's nice to be able to chat with people and communicate. Right. Um, instead of Visual Studio, I install Python because um, I'm not really a C guy. I, I know how to do it, but I'm not super good at it. And I'm really comfortable in Python because I used it for years doing scripting in Blender. Um, and also I install Blender, obviously, all the time. Um, FileZilla, I don't. I've got um, my website has a, a built-in. It's in cPanel. It's got like a, a built-in right. um, file upload download thing that I use and I just like being able to do it from any computer and not have to have like a separate FTP program. It could just do it in the browser. Right. Um, so I don't have a, a, for an upload download thing. Yeah. Um, for paint shop pro, interestingly, I do very often just use windows paint if I'm just trying to like crop out something. Um, cause it boots up really fast and you know, I can hit windows key PAI and enter and it comes up and you can paste the image in and then like, select the thing, control C to copy it, paste it into an email or whatever, uh, or add some text really easily. If I do need to do video or image editing, I always have the GIMP installed. And yeah, the GIMP does take a long time to start up. I, I don't know why it's so long, but it's like 10 seconds or whatever. But right. usually if I'm doing a bunch of image editing, I'm doing like a bunch of it. And so I'll just start up the GIMP and it's a one-time startup. And you know, then I work in it for an hour or two or whatever, whenever I'm editing. Um, and then there are a few other things. Audacity for audio editing um, works super great. I, I use it all yeah. the time for editing audio. It's basically all I use for audio stuff because uh, I tried using the Windows audio whatever thing for recording and it just doesn't doesn't do it. It doesn't do it for me. Uh, but, so Audacity. Uh, and aside about Audacity, one of the YouTubers I follow goes by the name Tanta Cruel. And uh, just yes. yesterday, I, I saw that video from him where he announced he's now the project lead on Audacity. Isn't so that was that confusing. Fun. <laughs> Do you use Audacity as well? I, I used to until Isaac took over editing the diecast for me. So now, I mean, it's still installed on my machine. There's no reason to uninstall it. But um, I, I can't remember the last time I fired it up. Hmm. I use it for recording audio for videos that I do, like voiceover and stuff. Um, sure. Anyway, so Audacity, oh, you know, and then there's a couple others. Hmm? Yeah, I use it for that. I forgot when I make a video, it's been a while. I really need to get a video out the door. But, um, yeah, when I record my narration for a video, I use Audacity. I totally forgot about that. There you go. I used to use it for speeding up audio for when I needed to do like a compressed video thing because Blender does not process audio at all. Um, but now DaVinci Resolve handles all that. So that's great. So, and then there's a couple more. Winderstat, which is a visual, uh, it's a Windows visual file browser. It basically helps you to see like where all the space on your hard drive is being used. And uh, so I install it on all my computers so that I can figure out what crazy huge game the kids have installed and uninstall it when they run out of hard drive space. Yeah. And also because I sometimes like record a bunch of videos and then forget that they're in some sort of weird subdirectory and like, wh why is my project directory like suddenly 20 gigabytes? Uh, right. So it's really nice to be able to find stuff. And then uh, the last thing is AHK, auto hotkey, which is a tiny little programming <sighs> language for automating 
uh, input output and windows processes and it is super super handy especially for doing repetitive tasks and uh, so i always I, have that I believe, installed i believe isaac uses that he's yeah. he's programmed a bunch of stuff and he uses it for some of his games he's he, he's got all kinds of crazy projects and and build stuff that he that he does um in roblox and i forget what he uses auto hotkey for but he he's writes little scripts and does cool things with them yeah i originally was introduced to auto hotkey through dwarf fortress again and uh dwarf fortress has its own scripting language like or, or automation hockey language built in or something like you can record hockey presses but it turns out that it actually works better if you use auto hockey than if you use its own built-in programming thing and uh, once i had been introduced to it i've just found a multitude of, of really handy use cases where you can use it to like i used it in hyperlight drifter to do um, an auto dash because you have to have a really precise like key press spacing and you can't just hold down to dash. And so I, I wrote a little thing where it just like presses the key on that frequency when you're holding it down and when you're playing Hyperlight Drifter. Um, and then what else? Like a bunch of games, Minecraft, automating things, uh, auto clicking stuff, uh, tons of uses in office work where if you're trying to like fill out forms or like, uh, there, you know, the, all those horrible like business management back ends where you have to like, fill in a whole bunch of little boxes over and over again and they don't have defaults and there's no way to load like a template and so you just have to like click this thing and select this thing in this menu and then go over to this tab and click this thing yep. and type this thing into this box and like all that stuff you just write an auto hotkey script for it and like push the button and then just sit back for like two seconds and it zaps it all in there it's just so so rewarding um AutoCAD, like doing drawing setup in AutoCAD. I, I did that, a bunch of scripts for a company. I think they're still using them where you can like open a new drawing, press a button and it like preps the whole thing and, you know, gets all the layer settings correct and everything. So just tons of tons of stuff where um, whether or not the people who designed the program that you're using were intending to automate it, there's almost always a way to automate it with AutoHockey. That's very cool. All right. I feel like we've done a show. Didn't quite get through the mailbags this week, but we're working on it. We got close. We got, oh, halfway through our mailbags. Okay, that's not close. That's 50%. <laughs> um, all right. Thanks to everybody who sent in questions. If you have a question for the diecast, the email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Back to Valheim.